All right. So thank, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I will talk about a different topic. Let's now totally switch topic. I will talk about radio astronomy and the hidden side of the universe. I will, of, of course, say in a minute what I mean for hidden and why this hidden side of the universe can only be explored by means of radio astronomy. So hopefully, uh, at the end of this talk, when you go back home, you can be able to an answer these kind of questions, like what is radio astronomy, what are the waves, how the universe and the objects in the universe look like at radio frequencies, and so on. So, before starting to, with the amazing world of radio astronomy, I need just a very brief and quick introduction on some basic concepts that are essential to understand what I will talking about. So, radio astronomy deals with radio waves, and radio waves are electromagnetic waves. An electromagnetic wave is, it consists just in an oscillation of a magnetic and electric field that is carrying home energy in the space at the speed of light. So just to understand what I'm talking about, just think of the waves you are familiar with, like waves in a sea or waves in the ocean. Here there are two examples of waves. And as you can see, these two waves are different. So how can we quantify how different are these waves? There are two important parameters, which are called one is wavelength. The wavelength is the distance between two consecutive peaks in a wave. And this means that here we have a long wavelength and here we have a short wavelength. The other concept is the frequency. You also heard about this for sure. So frequency is defined as the number of peaks in the interval, in, in, in the time range. So in this case, we have, for example, three peaks here. And here we have more than three. That means here we have low frequency and here we have high frequency. What I'm telling you is that the wavelengths and the frequency are inversely proportional. That means a long wavelength corresponds to low frequency and a short wavelength corresponds to high frequency. This is very important to understand. And the last thing is this uh, question here. Frequency is proportional to the energy. That means the lower the frequency, the lower the energy. The higher the frequency, the higher the energy. All right? That's it. That was just the the stage, just to understand what we are going to talk about. If we put all the waves all together, just all the waves of different wavelengths, they made up the electromagnetic spectrum. And so here we have waves with long wavelengths, which are the radio waves, which we are going to talk about tonight. And then as soon as the wavelength is shrinking and becoming shorter and shorter, we have infrared, visible, ultraviolet, up to gamma rays, where we have a very short wavelength and very high frequency and very high energy. All right? So what we are going to talk tonight is just the low part of the spectrum is the lower energy part, the one with the longer wavelengths, okay? So luckily enough, most of the electromagnetic radiation is shielded by our atmosphere. I mean, it's absorbed. That means that, for example, that gamma rays cannot reach, for example, the ground or the surface of the planet, which is very good. I mean, otherwise, life could not be possible on, on, on Earth, you know? This is why we can observe the sky with telescopes from the ground only in the optical, which is one of the two windows in which radiation can arrive, reach the ground. And the other window is just the radio wavelengths, you know? <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> The radio wavelength. So why is then important to look at the different frequencies? I mean, the reason is that when looking at different frequencies, we have different information on the same thing, and we can have the total, the global understanding of what's going on there. Let me just make a very easy example. So this is an optical image of four beautiful guys here that you can see. Um, so if we want to understand, for example, how human bodies are made, and we just look at the visible light, our knowledge will be limited only to the surface of the human body. So we can recognize the skin, we can recognize the hairs, but we don't really understand how the things work here. If we look at a different frequency, for example, if we look at X-rays, this is how they look like. And now we discover that there is a skeleton inside and this is how they can stand up, you know? Or if we look at a different wavelength, for example, let's move to the infrared. Now we have information about the temperature of the body, about the gradient of the temperature. And so now we can really understand how a human body works, you know? The same thing applies to galaxies, to sky, to the stars, to anything. So this, for example, is a view of our Milky Way, a different wavelengths. As you can see, every single wavelength from radio to gamma rays is giving us different information of the same object. 
That means for having a global understanding, we should look at every single frequency. For example, we can clearly see the galactic plane at gamma rays, at radio frequencies. We don't see this, for example, in the optical. If we want to see the molecular clouds, we need to go to this frequency here. That's why it's important. But let's focus now to radio frequencies. That is the main topic of this talk. All right. This is a portion of the sky as seen from a radio telescope. So now I have a question for you. What do you think? Is this picture at radio frequencies of the sky really, really very different from an optical image or not? What do you think? Is that different? I mean, yeah, not much. Apparently not much. But what I say is not that this is different. This is extremely different. Because every single point that you see here is not a star. Every single point here is a radio galaxy, is a quasar, is a supernova remnant, is a molecular cloud. So here we have a totally different view of the sky. I mean, if we only look at the sky at optical wavelengths, we can see the stars. But the sky is not made only of stars. If we look at different frequencies, we have more information, you know? So let's make another example. This is another bunch of galaxies in uh, uh, optical frequencies. You can see different sides, different shapes, and I mean, just by looking at this image, what we can guess, for example, is that this is bigger, maybe, simply because this is closer than the others, you know? But this is not the real story, because if we look at the same portion of the sky, that is about two degrees, at radio frequencies, this is what's going on there. I mean, what we discover here is that these galaxies are interacting. So, and then there is a lot more matter here, which is hydrogen distribution just around the galaxy. Why do we need to do this? Because if, for example, we track the motion of the galaxies, or even if we want to track the motion of the speed of single stars within the bulk of this galaxy, for example, and we just apply the Kepler law, what we find is something different than what we measure. And this is exactly because we are not taking into account all this hydrogen that is here. So this radio emission is produced um, by a, a transition, a spin transition of an electron that is, you know, spiraling, uh, rotating around a proton. And at some point, this spin will, the electron will flip the spin and will produce a photon that is exactly 21 centimeters, which is radio wavelengths. This is why this kind of emission is invisible to other wavelengths. Why this is why this is the hidden side of the world. You can only see this distribution here only if you look at radio frequencies. So. This is another example. So this guy here is an object of our solar system. This is not a joke. It's really an object of our solar system. C can you guess who is this guy here? I you are very familiar, I'm pretty sure. It's Milky Way? Nope. It's an object of the solar system. Can be a planet. Yep, yep. Can be a moon or. Yep. Somebody said Jupiter. Yes, great, man. This is exactly Jupiter. That's are you surprised? So, could you believe that this is totally different from what Jupiter looks like at optical frequencies? I mean, when we look at this image here, we really discover that around Jupiter, surrounding Jupiter, there is this strong magnetosphere that we cannot see in at other wavelengths. And this is produced by a different mechanism here, which is called the synchrotron emission, which is a kind of emission produced when a relativistic electron is accelerated along uh, magnetic field lines. Let's make another stunning example. I mean, this is really impressive. So we have here another optical image of a portion of sky. As you can see, there are different galaxies, several galaxies. Let's focus on this galaxy here, just in the middle. If you look at this galaxy, it just look, looks like a fluffy blob, you know, just like a boring galaxy there, you know, not really interesting. But what if we look the same galaxy at radio frequencies? So, this is what we see if we look at radio frequencies. Can you see it? So, this is amazing. So, we can really see these big, these huge structures that are standing much, much more far away of the galaxy itself. You know what does this mean? This means that when you look at radio frequencies, this is indicating that there is a monster here that is pushing this plasma at such a distance from the galaxy itself. Indeed, what is going on here is that there is a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy that through a strong emission uh, magnetic field lines is pushing 
these relativistic plasmas through the um, rotational axis. You know, to understand this mechanism, the only way was just to look at radio frequencies, because by only looking at optical, you know, everything was looking so calm and so relaxed there, you know? Now, you know um, what is radio astronomy, you know what are radio waves, you know what, how the sky at radio frequencies looks like. So, you know many things. Let's now try to understand why radio telescopes are that big, or are, in any case, bigger than any other telescope. So, maybe you can guess why. There are two reasons for this. The first reason, the first good reason, is because of resolution. I mean, resolution, maybe all of you are familiar with resolution. In this case, it's the ability of the telescope to resolve two points in the sky. So, this is proportional to the wavelength. That means higher wavelength, higher resolution, lower wavelength, lower resolution, and we are at lower wavelengths. And it's inversely proportional to the antenna diameter. So, that means the larger is the diameter, the smaller is this number, the better is the resolution. That's why we need as much large as possible telescopes. The second reason is because of sensitivity. Sensitivity, again, is proportional to the antenna diameter. That means the higher, the, the, the larger the dish, the better the sensitivity. The sensitivity is the ability of an instrument, any instrument, to detect faint sources, faint objects. Why do we really need that much sensitivity in a radio telescope that we build such huge antennas? So, just to make you understand, usually when we observe an extragalactic radio source, the power that we want to measure is something of the order of one Jansky. So, Jansky is a unit uh, that we use in radio astronomy, which corresponds to 0 0.00000000. It's 26 zeros, guys. One. Watt per hertz per meter square. You know, it's really, really, really faint. This is why we need such huge dish. Just to make a super practical example to make you understand what we are talking about, let's consider the map of Bonn. This is Fiddler's, where we are now, and this is Beethoven's statue in the city center. So let's assume that we can put a radio telescope just here on the roof of uh, Fiddler's. And let's assume that Beethoven is holding a smartphone in his hand and uh, he's just making a phone call. You know what is the signal that a radio telescope here at Fiddler's receive the power of the signal from this smartphone on Beethoven's hands? I actually did run the math on, on my office a few days ago and this is the number I obtained. It's 10 to the 12 Jansky. I mean, we want to detect a one Jansky source, which is one of the brightest. And this is almost one trillion times stronger than the brightest source that we want to detect in the sky. So, I mean, I'm serious, I'm not kidding, guys. <laughs> this is what we are trying to do, and this is why we need that big dishes. So, this is, this is just, I'm showing some of the dishes that are in the world. This is a telescope with a 64 diameter in Italy, the Sardinia Radio Telescope. This is uh, a 100 meter diameter telescope, which is the Effersberg Radio Telescope that is just behind the corner here, uh, managed by the MPIFR. And this is, guys, actually the largest single dish telescope in the world. That is 500 meters. So, you know, this is a telescope with a diameter of half a kilometer. So it's, you know, huge. And something like this is expensive, is very difficult to manage because, you know, you have to keep all this, this in shape. I mean, at some point, we cannot really go much over than this. I also made another exercise. So I was asking myself, just to understand how such a telescope can be good, I was asking to myself how large a radio telescope should be to achieve a resolution which is comparable, at least to the one of human eyes at optical wavelengths. That is about one arc minute, let's say. So if you do the math, what you obtain is this value. So you know what does this mean? This means that even the largest radio telescope, single dish radio telescope in the world, has a resolution which is worse than our eyes. You know why this thing is challenging? And if we try to ob ob obtain a value, just a resolution of the order of any optical uh, um, telescope, just to see, okay, let's uh, try at least to have a resolution comparable to the optical one, that is of the order of one arc seconds, we should build a radio telescope with a diameter of 43 kilometers. <laughs> Again, I'm not kidding, guys. I'm very serious. However, even though we have these limitations, and numbers are telling us we have this limitation, I tell you that with radio telescopes, we can achieve 
the highest resolution ever achieved by any other telescope at any other frequency. And again, I'm not kidding. The answer is radio interferometry. So there was um, an entire talk about radio interferometry by Andrei Lobanov. You can find this talk on the YouTube channel of the Astronomy on Tap. I will just say a few words here. So the idea here is to use this technique called interferometry and to use several antennas, several small antennas at a certain distance and simulate a radio telescope with a virtual diameter equal to the distance of the antennas. In this case, we have these antennas over 30 kilometers in uh, New Mexico. This is called Jansky Very Large Array. And this is the kind of images that we can achieve, that we can obtain. You know, this is the very famous M87 um, galaxy. And, you know, we can see this very nice jet structure that is, you know, extending much, much further away than the galaxy itself. That means there should be a monster here inside. There should be a supermassive black hole pushing this gas here. Of course, we can still improve this resolution by putting telescopes on a larger distance. This is another array that is called Very Long Baseline Array, which is located in North America, and can simulate a radio telescope with a virtual diameter of 9,000 kilometers. I mean, wow. What we can do with this guy here, if you remember the image we obtained before, we can really zoom into there, and this is what we obtained. Again, the same galaxy by zooming in. I mean, now this is a fantastic result. However, we are still not happy with this. We still want to dig into here. We still want to zoom there. Indeed, if you put telescopes on different continents, you can really go all farther away. And so this is another array that is called the Global Millimeter VLBI Array. Actually, the headquarters of this project are just here in Bonn at the MPIFR where I'm working now. And we can simulate with this a radio telescope with a virtual diameter of 10,000 kilometers. Again, this is what we can observe with such an instrument. So this was the previous image. And we can now really zoom in the core region and obtain such a beautiful image. The, actually, this beautiful image was obtained by this guy who is over there, Jay Young. So thanks for his image. <laughs> <laughs> And now we can really see the fine structure and the transverse structure of the jet close to the black hole. I mean, now we can be maybe satisfied, but we are not. We want to still zoom there. And we can do it. We want really to zoom here to see this monster, to reveal the monster there, that is hiding there. Indeed, we can do this with this amazing project that is called the Event Horizon Telescope, which is spreading antennas all over the planet and is simulating an telescope with a virtual diameter of the Earth's sides. So this is exactly as the Earth itself is a radio telescope. You know, this is amazing. And what we can obtain with this is still zooming into there. And finally, we can reveal the guy. This is finally the black hole, the actual black hole that we can really image with such a high resolution. And this is, I mean, something that unprecedented. Nobody with any other telescope could reach such kind of resolution. So I was not kidding, guys, and we have the results here. All right, so I think my time is gone. Yes, this is actually the last slide. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope when you leave this place today, are, you are able to answer these uh, questions here that we had at the beginning. I'm pretty sure you can now. And if you have further questions, of course, I'm very happy to answer. So thank you very much.